Welcome to Democratically Speaking. Mark Lindy, your host for now. I'm the Ward 1 Chairman, and I'm doing this as a volunteer on my own time, not as the General Manager of Brockton Community Access. Today I have with me two people. I have the new leadership of the Brockton Democratic City Committee. I have Deb Garland, who is our new chair, and I have Jimmy Pereira, who is our new first vice chair. No strangers to politics, either one of you. No. Okay. <laughs> Deb, I know you've been involved for years and years in campaigns, different campaigns through the years. Jimmy's a, been a candidate himself yes. for mayor of Brockton, and now you guys are doing party organizing. Yes. yes. So um, we recently had a wonderful event um, over at West Middle School. We had uh, United States Senator Elizabeth Warren come and visit Brockton. We had just come off a few weeks before of having Senator Ed Markey come and do a town hall meeting. He is a he is um, not a candidate for re-election. Elizabeth Warren is. So, Deb, you were telling me off camera before we started recording yeah. that uh, you saw a whole different view of Elizabeth Warren at the Democratic State Convention this past weekend. Tell us what you tell us what you thought. I saw that she became human to me. Um, before I thought she was just a figurehead, mm -hmm. and she told her story um, how. She had been married young, and she divorced. Kind of connected with my own story. Mm -hmm. um, I just felt she was a person I could relate to. Well, when you see them on TV, mm -hmm. they look stiff and plastic sometimes. Right. It depends yeah. on the personality. Um, she, you know, she has a pretty strong, dynamic personality. She I does. Think. Right. And um, you see her in the sound bites. You see her a minute 30. But at the convention, you get to see her live and live. in person. And that resonated. It did. With you. It touched me. It touched uh, something I hadn't felt about her before. Mm -hmm. She became, like I said, human. Mm -hmm. And someone that was very likable. And you saw her here, we, the Democratic City Committee yes. had a presence at when, when Elizabeth Warren came here yes. over at West Middle School after we ended up on the doorstep outside. Yes. Okay, which was, which was fun. Which was fine, okay. yes. Um, uh, and Markey, you know, rallied the troops too. We're, we're, I think we're lucky in Massachusetts. We have an all-democratic congressional delegation, both of our United States senators and all the, all yes. the reps. Right. So, uh, Jimmy, what do you think? You, you were there too. I was, and it was very great. Uh, even though we, we stood outside, I think uh, we were very, uh, we, we adapted to the situation, the uh, audience and uh, the senator as well, and uh, the energy was great as well. And just to see everyone there, uh, horns honking, and uh, just people uh, livened up to see uh, Senator Warren, I think it was a great turnout and a great event. Well, it's a pretty dramatic contrast between the candidates running for United States Senate. Okay, we're all Democrats. We're all members of the Democratic yes. City Committee. Yeah. That's our senator. Right. Okay, there's a Republican who's a state rep who's in the next town. I've always been taught by all of my mentors never to say the name. Right. So I'm not right. going to do it. Right. Okay. <laughs> uh, so there's two Republicans running for Correct. Senate. And yes. there's one unenrolled yes. candidate, mm -hmm. independent. I hate that term, by the way. Yes. It sounds like you're not even enrolled right. at all to right. vote. They should change right. that back, yeah. but that's just my opinion. But, um, you know, the Democrats are strong. They fight mm -hmm. for working families. They yeah. fight for, um, you know, everybody to be included. Exactly. There's no exclusions yes. in, the, exactly. in, the, in the party. And, uh, you know, I think this is a dramatic election, especially with what's going on in Washington, right. D.C., which, God, it makes me crazy. <laughs> I turn on Morning <laughs> Joe or MSNBC. I do watch right. the other side. I watch Fox. <laughs> okay. okay, and yeah, I have I friends. Yep that I don't talk to anymore. Right. I, I talk to them, but we do not talk about, that's the third rail. Right. Yes. There you we, go. On Facebook, people uh, savage you if right. you say one thing out of place. Exactly. I have some friends I know that are very hardworking people, right. and they love the president. Yeah. And I'm like, why? Yeah. What's he ever going to do for you? I don't get it. That's why I don't put my opinions on Facebook. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, I have a. I, I'm involved with a. a, a it was. A, it's a private group. It was a Hillary group okay. back in the day, and it's been converted. Mm -hmm. There's about 35 oh, of us that I post the funniest political cartoon of the day. Yeah. That's anti. Well, that that would right. be fun. Okay, right. and to each his own. There, you know, that's the the world we live in, where democracy is key. Um, and you know, I think us as Democrats, it's being able to move forward and make sure that you know. 
at the end of the day that we look across the aisle and um, bring people together and uh, you know there's people that have the differences but as long as we're able to sit at the table together and move things forward I think is always very important. Well you look at our convention we just had. Right. There yes. are six candidates mm -hmm. okay there are three that are official nominees of the party that won the endorsement because of the numbers of delegates mm -hmm. but no one got excluded. Right. Everybody no. has the right to run exactly. no matter what your percentage is one way mm -hmm. or the other and my hope is that nobody bloodies the other one exactly. so then the Republicans can take it in November and right. turn it around and churn it exactly. and you know if, 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 if Massey to say something against Gonzalez mm -hmm. or Gonzalez mm -hmm. were to say something against Massey mm -hmm. to me that wouldn't be good no, no, I no. hope they're gonna I, stay I above that. I don't think either of those candidates would lead that way it would lead to that they both seem to be pretty conscientious of mm -hmm. you know not yeah. getting down in Exactly. The trenches. Very genuine people, and I've talked to both of them as well. And just looking at the characteristics and uh, what they uh, uh, speak on most of the time, definitely know that uh, that sh wouldn't. Hopefully, that shouldn't be an issue. Uh, and I think that uh, we're on the right track. So two good candidates for governor. Yes. Two good candidates for yes. lieutenant governor. Yes. Quentin Palfrey and Jimmy Tingle. Right. Yes. Okay. Good speeches. Exactly. Good videos. Um, and then two candidates for secretary of state. That one I was surprised by because yes. I thought the numbers were going to be the other way around. Right. We have an incumbent Secretary of State, right. you know, and I thought it was going to be 55-45 yeah. the other way, yeah. or 51-49. That's actually right. what I predicted, so I was a little off. Right. First time ever that all three of my candidates <laughs> yeah. actually yeah. won. I, I usually fight for the underdog, right. and sometimes the underdog doesn't win. Right. I was shocked. I, I and I heard. His, I was right up front. I went yes. on the convention floor. I grabbed a sign. I like Secretary Galvin too. Right, right. I just am a firm. But I'm not a complete term limits guy. But mm -hmm. I like to see change. change. And if we're talking yes. about younger people. Yes. Jimmy, you're how old? Twenty six. I'll be twenty seven. Okay. September. So if you really truly want to see younger people get involved. Right. There's a chance. Yeah, give him a shot, no, okay. for sure. The other guy has a lot more experience, right. but I want to see them debate. Mm -hmm. Right now, then Galvin's yeah. not agreeing to debate. Oh, I want to oh, see really? Galvin agree to debate. Right. I think everybody should debate, I okay? And, um, and more multiple debates, mm -hmm. the more the merrier. Right. I think that's the only way, that's why we try to do debates and candidates forums so people who right. get on TV, exactly. you can see them in person, person. you can personalize right. them just right. like you're talking about. Yeah. So, um, and then we have three great officers that are uncontested. We have State Treasurer Deb Goldberg. Goldberg. Yes. We have Suzanne Bump, our state auditor, who's yes. our neighbor in Easton now. Yes. She lives who, in Easton. Who has offered to do anything to help us here in Brockton. Great. We just have to give her a call. Exactly. We will. Yes, we will. Yes, and then we, we also have Mara Healy. Yes. Mara, she's better yeah. than Mara yeah. Healy. Right, she's, right. she's dynamic. I exactly. love to listen to Mara Healy yes. because yep. she's passionate. Now, I was for Warren Tolman the last election. Mm -hmm. okay. And then when Mara became the nominee, I stepped right up. I called her right. up and I said, I'll support you. And I haven't been the least bit disappointed. I think well, she's no, a great she's attorney. She's, she's a leader in the country. Job. She is. Yes, she she's, is. And she has a very she's bright future whether well. she chooses. Attorney generals have a bad stroke of luck. They don't right. ever get elected governor, right. ever. This might be the first time if she stays there, yeah. but who knows? Who knows? Who knows, yeah. who knows where any of them are going? There's one election. Trail, right? There's an election every day. The minute one is over, right. the next right. one's next over. Time starts. Right? Yeah. Right. Yep. So any, they gave me the three-minute cue. So okay. anybody want to take part of those three minutes and talk about anything specifically to Elizabeth Warren, and then we're going to watch the Elizabeth Warren video, and we'll come back and we'll talk Democratic City Committee. Um, sure, I'll take a stab uh, at it, and uh, for me, it's, uh, to the viewers, to make sure that you look at the authenticity and listen to the words that she's saying, and uh, we hope that it, it uh, gravitates you towards the uh, Democratic Party, and uh, hopefully that you'll be able to join our party as well, too, at the uh, Brockton Democratic City Committee. Um, for me, it's about making sure that you, again, are inclusive and that you're bringing everyone to the table, but that you're standing up and fighting uh, for those that can't speak up for themselves. And I think she does that uh, quite often. She does. Yes. So Couldn't have said I better. would just add that she has a wonderful video out that came out today from right okay. from the floor of the uh, convention. convention. Yeah. And it's marvelous. Check it out on nice. her Facebook page. Um, We'll get it, and we can get do it. excerpts of it with permission to put on your next edition of Democratically Speaking. There we go. So we'll skip permission. There you go. So I got the one-minute cue, and I'm going to use the final minute to let you know that I'm temporary host of this show. I yes. met Phil in once in a while as the Ward One chair. Right. Okay, but 
the two new hosts, we're going to get them acclimated, we're going to get them comfortable with TV, and we're going to educate you during the election process. So take a look at Elizabeth Warren's town hall meeting, and we'll be back to talk more about the Brockton Democratic City Committee. Because it's such a beautiful day, we decided to have it outdoors rather than indoors because we want to get some sunshine. And our good U.S. Senator brought the sunshine to the city of Brockton. Now, before I introduce my fellow state committee member who's going to introduce the senator, I have to recognize a few of our elected officials. Representative Gerald, Jerry Cassidy is here. Let's give him a round of applause. Woo! City Councilor Gene Bradley Darren quartered behind me. City Councilor Jack Lally, City Councilor Moise Rodriguez, School Committee Member Lisa Plant, from the Southeastern Regional School Committee Mark Lindy, City Councilor Susan DeCastro, and, and City Councilor Shirley Azak, and I know there's a lot of our City Committee people here, and I apologize if I miss anybody, and I also want to recognize our superintendent of the Brockton Public Schools, which is the best school in the Commonwealth, Kathy Smith. So I'm going to introduce my mentor, my good friend who got me on the state committee when I was a lot thinner and less gray hairs, with Paul Red Sullivan, who's looking down on, on us from heaven, is our fellow Democratic State Committee member and a great supporter of all of ours, our great friend Alan Pesovitz. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. What a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Come on. Yeah. Brock to the city of champions. I was thinking about this this morning as I, as they, after they asked me if I would do this, and I was thinking that six years has gone by very quickly. We had a wonderful, wonderful campaign here in Brockton for Senator Warren. It was very exciting. In fact, we have a couple of folks, staff folks that have come back. Carl comes home to roost. <laughs> and so we're back here again. We're back here to support a fine Democrat, Senator Elizabeth Warren. As times are tough politically right now, we need Elizabeth Warren more than ever. I'm going to leave you with what my daughter said this morning. She was unable to be here. And she said, I said, can you come? She can't. She's sick right now, so she couldn't come. But she said, she's smart, she's cool, cool, and she's tough. <laughs> Senator Elizabeth Warren! comfortably seated, but you know, we're a tough lot. It takes a lot more to slow us down than just locking us out of the building, right? So everyone wanted to be cautious. The most important thing is we keep everybody safe. But you know, this gives a whole new meaning to grassroots democracy. We stand in the grass and do democracy. That's what we're going to do. I really am so pleased to see all of you here today. And I know it's tough. You're standing up. You're in the sunshine here. Uh, so I thought what I'd do is I'll just talk just as quickly as I can, just a few minutes. And then we'll take a few questions. And then we'll do the most fun part. We'll line up and do selfies. Everybody okay with that? Yeah, that's the fun part, right? So I want to talk to you just a little bit about what's going on in Washington, but what's going on right here in Massachusetts and right here in Brockton. You know, it's tough in Washington, and the attacks on democracy are just one after another after another. We now have, as the official policy of the Republican Party, try to win by keeping American citizens from voting. The American citizens that they think might vote Democratic. Just do what you can on voter suppression, gerrymandering, voter suppression, and the whole business of Russia interfering with our elections. We have a president who just says, la, 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 I don't want to hear that, right? So the whole notion of how democracy works, it works from the people. It is of the people. This is our fight. And so in 2018, what this is going to be about is going to be about making sure 
that everybody turns out to vote, that everyone's voice is respected, that everyone's vote is counted. That's why we're here. You bet. And there's so much we can talk about. And like I said, we'll take some questions, talk about some of it. But there's one issue in particular that I want to talk about for just a minute. And that is the opioid crisis that has swept across this commonwealth and across this country. We have now reached a point in America where I don't think there's a family that isn't touched by it. It doesn't have someone they know, someone they love, who has been caught in the grip of this addiction. Today in America, 115 people will die from a drug overdose. It's like a plane crash. And it will happen tomorrow and the next day and the next day. We're losing the equivalent of a plane crash. 115 people every single day, 365 days a year. And for every person who dies, how many more who are lost to their families, lost to the people who love them? And yet, what has been the response in Washington, the place where there are real resources? The response has been a little here, change some of the rules there, but not really attack this problem head on. So I started talking about this with a good friend of mine, uh, Elijah Cummings. Some of you may have know him, congressman from Maryland, a good man. And Elijah and I talked about, you know, this is how it was back during the AIDS crisis. Year after year, the numbers kept going up and the response from our federal government was a little of this, a little of that. And you know why? Because it was about them. It was about someone else. It was about stigma. It was about, well, this is their fault. This is not our problem. It's their problem. The same thing has happened around opioids. It's their problem. It's their fault. And so when did it change with AIDS? It changed when a little boy, Brian, uh, Ryan White, Ryan White was 14 years old when he publicly announced that he had HIV AIDS. And an entire nation changed its point of view. And our own Ted Kennedy teamed up with Orrin Hatch, Republican and Democrat, to say we're going to pass a law, they called it the Ryan White Care Act, that put real resources into fighting back against the AIDS epidemic. And you know what? AIDS is still out there, but we turned the tide, brought down the numbers, and people are alive today because of the job that Washington did on this. So Elijah and I talked about this and said, let's do the same thing for the opioid epidemic. Let's get out there, you and me, and let's fight for this. Let's get people all across the country signed on that we put real resources. And so Elijah and I just introduced a bill just a few days ago down in Washington to put $100 billion over the next 10 years to fighting back against the opioid epidemic, to do it right here. And just so you know, that's $10 million a year. It would mean about uh, $10 billion a year. It's about $166 million right here in Massachusetts. It's money that would go, this is another part of the bill. It doesn't say Washington knows everything. It says Washington can be a good partner for the towns that are on the front line. It can be a good partner for the community health centers that are on the front line. So we want to push this money straight down to those who are actually fighting the fight. So they know what's needed in their towns, what's needed in their communities, what's needed in their families to make a real difference. And one more part about this that I just want to mention to all of you. It's real money, and people say, God, that sounds like a lot of money. And it does sound like a lot of money. $100 billion over 10 years, $10 billion a year. The Trump administration estimates that last year, the opioid crisis cost us in America $500 billion, easily. And ask the parents who've lost a child, how much did it really cost? that someone you loved is now gone. Ask the child who's lost a parent, how much does it really cost? You know, this is the second year in a row that life expectancy in America has gone down. And the 
principal reason is because 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds are dying from this crisis. So here's how I see this. It's easy to think of government as way off in Washington. Who cares? It's all about tweeting and crazy stuff. No. It's about whether or not that government in Washington is going to be a partner to us back here in Brockton. And we can make it a partner. What it takes to make it a partner is we get in this fight and we fight it side by side together. That's how democracy is supposed to work. So, you bet. So, we got to be in this fight together. I wanted to mention that one in particular right at the top, but I'm going to ask Jean Bradley to come over here Call on people, let's try to do a few questions, and then like I said, we'll line up, we'll do some pictures, and we will turn what was going to be a town hall into a town picnic together. <laughs> all right, yeah. it's all yours, Sean Gray. Whatever you think, we'll okay, do Okay, let's do it, we're gonna start over here. Question. Okay, well. Oh, they have numbers. Okay, so, oh, you know, yeah. as, 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 we, as, we, as we step out, the change sort of like change. So I'm gonna ask for number one. Okay, let me just pick people. So, okay. Just raise your hand and pick somebody. Just raise your hand and I'll pick you. Just raise your hand. You first. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Hi. Love your fashion statement. She's got her nevertheless she persisted t-shirt. Hi. It's nice to meet you. My name is Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi. So, one of my biggest concerns is net neutrality. Yes. I am... I am obviously of this, of a, I'm a millennial, I'm of this age, um, I go to college online, and I use online every day, I'm on my phone all the yep. time, so what is something you can do or that you are working on at the moment? Okay, so let me just get everybody into it so you can hear the question as well as the end, let me do it. So our question is about net neutrality, and let me remind everyone what net neutrality is all about. Right now, we have basically an internet, an email system, and so on, digital system, that everybody gets access to it at the same speed. But what some of the big companies want to do is they want to be able to buy super highway access, and they want to be able to leave everybody else on dirt road access. Now, I want you to think about the consequences of that. Melissa says, I go to school online. Schools are not known for having the kind of bucks that the big companies have so she ends up on dirt road neutrality. Anybody start a small business that has any online part to it, right? You try to buy stuff online, you try to sell stuff online, you just try to let people know where you are online. Part of the issue here is do you get the same access everyone else does, or do the big guys who can pay big money, do they get the super highway access and you get trapped back on the dirt road? So net neutrality matters to all of us. It matters to millennials, but believe me, it matters to all of us. Because it matters to whether or not we're building an economy that works for everyone, whether or not we have educational opportunities that work for everyone. So here's the deal. During the Obama years, we got a rule in place for net neutrality to protect it. That is, everybody gets the same access. What's happened is we now have a chair of the FCC who has rolled that back and said no. But we have a period of time in Congress to roll back the rollback. You following me here? Yay! All it takes is 51 votes. You're gonna love this part. We have 50 votes. We are one vote away. We expect to do a vote in a couple of weeks. And what we gotta do is we gotta pick up one more person. Frankly, I'll be blunt. We've got to pick up one more Republican. We got our Democrats on this, and we've already picked up a Republican. So we got to pick up another Republican. If we do that, we get net neutrality. Now, here comes the best part. I'll be in there fighting. You bet I'm in there fighting. I talk about this on the floor of the Senate. I buttonhole people. I'm actually just kind of in people's faces about this. So I know you're all shocked to hear that. <laughs> um, but here's the deal. Um, we got to find a way to get some outside pressure on these folks. We have tried, the plan was as you came in the door, to get everybody's email address 
who's here? Have we, did we manage to do that? I'm looking for my staff. Did we manage to do that? We got everybody signed up. Is that right, Jerry? Almost everybody signed up. If you're not already signed up, see the cool guy over here that had the shades on? Yeah. Nice smile. Yeah. We want to make sure we get everybody signed up because one of the things that will happen when this event's over today is we'll get in touch with you about how to stay in the fight, but we will particularly get in touch with you about how to raise some noise about net neutrality and be in this fight in particular because it's the one coming up in just a few weeks. Okay? All of us together. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Number seven. Number seven. Okay. Number seven. Okay, if number seven is that you, you over there. You, yeah. Are you number seven? There, you there is no number seven. Uh -huh. They won't pick it up. Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Come on up. 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 She's coming. She's coming. You have seven. Yeah, come on. Yeah, you. you. Yeah, you can use the mic. Yep. That's the mic. This is kind of hard for Brian. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Hello, Senator. My Hi. name is Jean, and I'm from the show. Hi, Jean. Um, what I'm not concerned with, and I'm going to ask if you can follow up on this. Sure. Recently, there's been a lot of discussion on this Dr. Ronnie Jackson. And I'm not saying anything about his qualifications because I don't believe he was qualified. Uh -huh. My concern is. There's been a lot of accusations thrown out there, and I don't see any of the backup as to how this gentleman could serve three presidents and have this come out now. So I'm asking you to follow up and get an answer for all of us what, what the truth is um, and document what really happened. So I appreciate it. It's a good question. Your question was about what happened with Dr. Ronnie Jackson and how could all of this information come out now after he was a doctor to three presidents and this information hadn't become public. So is it true? Is it not true? So I'm just going to say two things about this. The first one is it is a reminder, what, whatever is the underlying truth here, about why we do advise and consent in the Senate, that the president doesn't simply say when he runs a government for these top posts, I want you, I want you, I want you. You count on the president to vet them, but you also count on the United States Senate to come back and do a second check, a close check on each of these people about their public record, but also what else they have done in their lives. And that was the Veteran Affairs Committee had done this, and it was a bipartisan investigation. So they were going forward on a bipartisan basis. Information was made public when he was still a candidate, when he was still pushing his name forward. Now he has withdrawn his name, and now that he's withdrawn his name, I'm just gonna be frank. I'm. I'm not clear whether or not we'll get access to any more of this information and how much will become public going forward. Within the White House, these are, those are the non-confirmed jobs, it's basically up to the president and presidents before him to make the decisions about who they want there. It's only when they move over to a big public position like heading up the VA that you get this much bigger public scrutiny. So I will ask because you asked me to, but I, I really do want to, want to be clear. I, I'm not sure if we'll be able to get more information because he has now withdrawn and said he doesn't want to, doesn't want to talk about this anymore. But, but he did have accusers. He I, did. I, I'm correct, there were like 23 accusers. Yes. So I don't know where you go with that if the accusers come out and uh, give facts. Uh, you know, right. I, I'm not for anything that the Trump administration does. Believe I hear you. But this bothers me when somebody can be accused of something and not have the I, I, I totally understand, and but we both understand it's also difficult for people who are serving in other roles in government who are very worried about having to make a public statement that may affect their careers in the future. So it was a real, I think there was a real trade-off in this. Okay. 
and going forward. But thank, thank you. you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. So now, now we got the numbers. I'm going to oh, go for 2907-246. And then right. the next one would be 2907-175. And then after that, I got Pat Foley and the lady on the wheelchair over there. We got four people behind them. Let's go on the mic. I'll call your nose. Come on up. Hello. Hello. Hi. My name is Susan Glover. I'm from Hanover. Hi, Susan. Hi. I think we're all here for the same reason. What I'd like to know is what is the one thing that everybody in this crowd can do after you talk to us? Okay. Take some action. What can every single person do? So I love this, Susan. This is a great question. I want to tell you all something. This is my 25th town hall, which will be the most remarkable because we're going to have to call it a front yard hall from now on. Uh, but, but the one question I have been asked, the only question I have been asked at every single town hall is what else can I do? What can I do to make my voice heard in Washington? So I'm going to give you three things that you can do. All right, the first one, if you haven't already done it, is join a group. And if you've joined one group, join two. And if you've joined two, consider joining three. And there is a very specific reason for this. It's like the point around net neutrality. When you're with a group, the group tells you what's coming up next and lets you know sort of what the state of play is. So it's a way for us to get engaged and to make a difference in an organized way. The second thing that you can do is talk to someone who doesn't agree with you. I'm serious. We cannot spend all our time talking to each other. We have got to talk to people who don't agree with us. We got to be willing to reach out. And I know that means you got to have a conversation with your cranky uncle, right? Uh, it means you've got to talk with your brother-in-law. It may mean you need to talk with a coworker, somebody in front of you in line at the grocery store. But this is powerfully important. One of the things that I think is very much in trouble right now in the United States is that people have pulled to their camps. And what we've got to do is we've got to come back together. And let me just give you a hint on this one. Pick a thing that you want to talk about, but make it personal and make it about your values. You really care about student loan debt? Make that the thing you talk about. You really care about expanding Social Security and why it is so important to protect it, to expand it for those who rely most on it. Talk about that. You really care about the rising cost of health care and the fact that right now the Republicans in Washington are doing everything they can to take away federal support for keeping the cost of health insurance low. Then talk about that. Make yourself knowledgeable about one thing and then do it. And the third thing, make a commitment. A commitment to do something every day. And it can be whatever you decide it is. You can make it public, you can make it not public. That you're going to talk to one new person every day. You're going to send one email every day. You're going to make one post every day, one text every day. And I'll tell you why. It's because when you make a commitment, you chip at it a little every single day. That's when you start to make a difference. And you make a difference not only out there in the world, you make a difference in your own heart. And that's the way we're going to return this America. That's the way we're going to make this America. Once again, not just work for a thinner and thinner slice at the top, but make this America work for all of us. So thank you. It's a you. great question. Thank you. And I'm proud to say that I volunteered to be a delegate at the Mass State Convention Yay. to represent Hanover. Good for you. Thank you. Good for you. Thank you. The next one. Oh, I think we have the next one. Oh, perfect. Oh, can you put the mic down for us? Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator. This is an honor. I'm Janet. I'm from Abington. Hi, Janet. Hey, Janet. My concern is Sinclair Broadcasting yes. and the lack of the FCC to provide proper oversight. These are public airways, and they are being taken yep. over by a few groups. And I know the Mercers are involved in this, too. Could you please address that? Yes. 
So thank you very much. The same head of the FCC that is trying to destroy net neutrality is also on board for saying, in effect, we're just going to have one voice that speaks to America and provides what is so-called local news, but with a big dose of their own political viewpoint. I think this is fundamentally wrong. I've spoken out against it on the floor of the United States Senate. I've written against it. I'm going to keep emailing and posting against it. These are public airways, and they are part of our chance to talk to each other. And we need to maintain a level playing field, a fair opportunity for everyone to make their voice heard, not just that of a handful of billionaires. So thank you. Good thank you, Senator. Thank you. Yeah, um, you Good afternoon, Senator Warren. Thank you so much for coming to the City of Champions. My name is Teresa Alphonse. I graduated in 2009 from Brockton High School. There I excelled. There I excelled in academics and track. Combined, my parents have dedicated nearly 55 years to the Brockton public school system. On April 6, 2018, my dad was teaching at Brockton High School. I rushed to my alma mater to retrieve a set of keys from him. Completing the errand, I was off to my car to drive to Providence Airport. That never happened. Instead, I was arrested on the campus of Brockton High School, told that I had raised police suspicion similar to what occurred at the Parkland shooting. I was repeatedly yelled at and silenced when I attempted to voice my legitimate reasons for being on campus that day. I was forced to suffer the insult and embarrassment of being booked at the Brockton police station, then detained in a cell for nearly four hours. These police officers filed criminal charges against me for trespassing, resisting arrest, and disturbing the peace. Although all charges were dismissed in court, the humiliation of that day is with me daily. I sought out a lawyer to protect the civil rights I had after this abuse. My attorney requested footage from this incident, which the, the police department refuses to give us. I am currently the Community Health and Wellness Program Manager at Brockton Neighborhood Health Center. I have a master's degree in public health from the University of Miami. I'm a mental health advocate. My reputation is very important to me, both on the business and personal level. Prior to April 6, I had a clean record. It is especially emotionally hurtful for me that this arrest occurred at Brockton High School. Mm -hmm. I will never be able to adequately articulate the disgrace that was unfairly put upon me. My navigation of the justice system has been emotionally taxing and has exacerbated my anxiety. I think about those who are less educated, do not have the wonderful family that I have, and do not have the resources to fight injustice. For them, I weep. Senator Warren, I ask, what can be done to ensure that we are protected by law enforcement and not hurt by them? Thank you. So let me start by saying I am very sorry for what happened to you, but most of all what you should know is you are not alone and you will never be alone. We're here with you. The second thing is, I'm, I'm going to, Jean, can I get you back over here? I, I want to ask somebody from the city here whether or not there is an investigation into this that's pending at this um, point. Can you say a word? Well, I mean, as, we speak, as we speak, I'm not aware of this situation, but um, let's talk after this event. I'll be more glad to drop into okay. it. Okay. Thank you. Thank let's, you. let's look into it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And telling you so the question is about health care and the importance of making sure that everyone has access to the health care they need. So let me just see if I can do this, answer it in a bigger sense, okay? And we'll see if we can get all the, ma the major pieces out there. Let me start with what I think is the first premise we should start with in America, and that is health care is a basic human right, and we yeah, fight for yeah, basic yeah. human rights. Yeah. From there, we have two questions that we need to address. The first is how we make sure everyone gets covered, and this was a big part of what the Affordable Care Act did, trying to expand coverage so that everyone has access to health care coverage. The second is how we pay for health care in a way that is both the lowest cost and at the same time the best health care outcomes for everyone. That there is no difference, that everybody gets a chance to do that. Lower cost, higher outcomes. How do we manage to do that? Now, 
There have been a lot of proposals on the table, and I want to be clear. I'm, I'm on, I, I will let a thousand flowers bloom around this. I'm willing to look at all of the health care proposals. What I have also put on the table that I have added to the health care debate is that I think we need some basic accountability for health insurance companies that now cover a very large portion of our population and will cover them in the future. And I want to mention just two parts on that. The first is many of you know me from my long years in basic consumer protection around banks that cheat people and are payday loans and mortgages and student loans and trying to get a level playing field, something that's fair. I put a proposal on the table that says, you know what, in the same way that you can get tricked and cheated on complex financial documents, the same thing happens in insurance. You don't find out what's not covered until long after you get sick, and then it's too late to do anything about it. So I put a proposal in place to have more consumer protection, that is, more basic guarantees in an insurance plan. I think it's an important part of what we do. And also to say to the insurance companies, if you're not willing to offer insurance coverage in a state, you know how there have been problems around the country, then the answer is you should not be able to get the lucrative contracts for Medicare and Medicaid. If you're in on providing health care coverage for America, then you're in on providing health care coverage for America. So I say this by way of saying there are a lot of complex pieces to doing this. Another piece of this has been the fight for Medicaid that has gone on over the past year. You know, there are a lot of folks who thought, I, I got my Medicare, that's all I need, or I've got my health insurance, that's all I need. I just want to talk for one minute about what Medicaid does. Medicaid is two out of every three people who lives in a nursing home right now because they live longer than their savings and they count on Medicaid to help pay the bills so they can stay there. Medicaid is how people who have serious disabilities get access to a home health care aid or access to a very expensive wheelchair. The things that just aren't covered by, um, by private insurance companies. Medicaid is what steps in when a family has a baby that has complex medical needs and runs up a million dollars worth of medical expenses in the first month and needs therapists and special breathing equipment. Medicaid is what we say to each other about what it means to be part of the human family. We say as a country, I don't know whose grandma runs out of savings but needs care. I, I don't know who gets hit by a bus and is unable to walk and going to need a lot of help going forward. I don't know who has the next baby that needs a whole lot of help to be able to reach that baby's full potential. But what I do know is that every one of us as Americans should pitch in so that whoever it hits has got the rest of America to rely on, that that's what it means to be part of the great American family. We may not get all the pieces right at any given moment, but boy, that's where we got to be aiming. We've got to be aiming toward an America where everybody gets coverage and everybody can afford it, where everybody gets full coverage, where people are not making choices between whether or not to pay the rent and pay their medical bills. That has to be the America that we keep working on. Right now, this is one of the biggest fights in Washington. And to me, this, this gives us a great place just to kind of summarize this. This is the fundamental question that faces us in 2018. Who does this government work for? The Republicans went behind closed doors, locked the doors, and negotiated only among themselves, their donors, and their lobbyists 
a trillion and a half dollars in tax cuts to billionaires and giant corporations. Think about that. Think what we could have done with a trillion and a half dollars invested here in America. And by the way, just a little piece out to the side of that money, that trillion bucks that goes out to giant multinational corporations, more than 40% of it goes to rich overseas investors. Doesn't even stay here in the United States. We just shoveled your tax dollars out the door so it doesn't even stay here in the United States. That is a government. That is a political party that is there to serve the donor class, there to serve the lobbyists, there to serve the billionaires, and we are here to fight back against that. That's why I am here. So, for every one of you who showed up today, I'm sorry we couldn't do more questions and do this when you didn't have to squint into the sun, but I really want to say we're going to line up, everybody will get a chance to talk if you want to do this, but let me tell you how grateful I am to each and every one of you for showing up. You know, it is the case. They got money. They got power. They got the Mercer brothers. They've got the Koch brothers. They've got what's now called dark money. They've got their own way of seizing power in this country and then making this government not work for you, making this government work for them. And what we're about here is to remind everyone, they may have that, but there's more of us than there is of them. Yeah. And we are here to fight back. So thank you for being here today. Thank you. Back with Democratically Speaking, I'm sitting in studio with Deb Garland, the new chair of the Brockton Democratic City Committee, and Jimmy Pereira, the new first vice chair. Just to let you know, there are other officers and people involved. The second vice chair is Joan Madden. The treasurer is Deb Mullen. The secretary is Susan DeCastro, and then I'll run down the wards. Yours truly, I'm the Ward 1 chair. Bill Hill is the Ward 2 chair. Steve Thomasy is the Ward 3 chair. Susan is the Ward 4 chair and the city councilor in Ward 4. Uh, ward 5 is Doris Smith. Ward 6 is Peggy Curtis. And Ward 7 is Jimmy. Yes. So few of us have a couple of hats on. And then there are other people that are involved. We have a lot of our elected officials yes. that are Democrats. Okay. Each ward as, is can be an individual committee, but we meet collectively. There are seven wards, and there can be up to 35 members in each ward that are elected mm -hmm. during the presidential primary, mm -hmm. okay? And then if we don't fill the 35 seats, we're in the process of filling the vacant seats, and all you gotta do is fill out a, a, a membership form, come to a meeting, get elected by your ward, and then you're on the committee. You have to, the only obligation is you have to be a registered Democrat. Mm -hmm. We cannot take an unenrolled candidate, and we will not take a Republican and there's a Republican city committee for that. So, Correct. you know, we're looking for more members. We're looking for younger members, older members, in between. Everybody's welcome. One thing about the Democratic Party is everybody is welcome exactly. under that tent. And we're not, we're not rich and we're not elitist. No. Right. We're working class. Brockton exactly. has always had a strong presence. Brockton is one of the Democratic strongholds right. in Massachusetts. So we're looking to build party and build exactly. unity and get people involved. Exactly. Exactly. So, so Deb, talk about your vision as the chair. And I know we're just starting the meetings. We have an executive board meeting yes. coming up this week. To, where, where are we going? We have, meet, we have a few scheduled meetings coming up. I think it's July 20... 24th. 26. 26. It's a Thursday, Thursday night July over to 26. Firefighters Hall. Yes. Keating Hall, it's called. Keating on Hall. Perkins. AD right. Perkins. Street. Right next to the Enterprise Club. Yes. yes. Okay. And uh, summer's coming up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're going to do our big. We have a big um, event on September 16th, mm -hmm. which is the Paul and Jean Sullivan um, Memorial Breakfast. And. We'd like to invite everyone from the community, if you're, well, Democratic and mm -hmm. 
or others that would like to we'll join us. We'll take that enrolls. We'll convert them right. over. Yeah. Right, exactly. that, just think about it. We've <laughs> done that over right. the years. There are a lot of people that have been Republicans. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then they've gone to unenrolled, and then we've scooped them right into exactly. the Democratic Party. Yes. Right. Okay, Ray Hennigson was a yes. Republican, and, and we got him. Jack Lally. Jack Lally. Yeah. Um, back in the day, Wayne Carter. We have a lot right. of people yes. that have seen the light and right. have joined yeah. us. Yeah. How's that? But the Red and Red Sullivan, Paul Red Sullivan, and Jean Sullivan. Jean was a wonderful, she wonderful, was a wonderful behind woman. the scenes organizer. She never ran for office, nope. but she was the power she, behind that 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 <laughs> Red Sullivan, who was a powerful well, personality. Well, Red was a Sullivan. Red Sullivan was a very powerful man. He was a pusher. Right. right. Mm -hmm. um, I did many campaigns with him. I was on the trail. And uh, he cracked the whip. <laughs> he sat at that desk. But lovingly. He, he manned the office. I always told him, uh, it, it, Paul, if he didn't want to give you a hard time, mm -hmm. you weren't his friend. Right. Paul right. would say, I said to Paul, I learned everything I know from you. He said, I must have done, done a terrible job then. I said, Paul, don't say that. <laughs> yeah. Now, Paul ended up at Bay Point, and yes, he was he in did. the same place where my father was. Oh, wow. And my father hates politics, right. hated politics. He's passed too. But they used to have breakfast together, yeah. and they used to talk politics. My father, the only good politician, is a dead politician. Yeah, right. So wow. when I got involved, he says, what are you doing that for? You can't lie, cheat, and steal. What are you doing involved in that? I said, they were public servants too. Right. It's not just yes. politics exactly. and politicians. Right. And uh, dad was very proud of all of his civil service exams. Right. He never mm -hmm. took a political appointment. He hated right. politics. But when I ran for school committee, he says, what are you going to go do that for? I said, it's to help kids. He says, oh, okay, I'll let you right. do that. Then right. I ran for state rep. He says, oh, wait yeah, a minute. Right. You get in the pool with the sharks, you either got to become one of them <laughs> right. or get eaten by them. That's right. what he told me. That True. was his exact quote. Well, and then when I ran for probate, okay. he's like, what are you doing? That's that's even more. I said, it's in the blood. Yeah, I took right, an action right. politics right. 1976 yes. class okay. way before you were born, Jimmy. The right. teacher's union president taught it. Linda Belzotti yes. and I took oh, that wow. class together. Okay. And our assignment was to work on political campaigns awesome. in order to get an A. So you got wow. the bug. I got the bug. Exactly. Now my nickname in high school was mayor. Little did I yeah. know that she would be the mayor and go. I wouldn't. Right, but that's right. okay. I I, yeah. I, I, I I like what I do because it's all community and all ties in and you get to cover it. Exactly. Sometimes it's better to have a press pass right. than to be an yeah, elected official. True. Those yeah. people could have access to any place any at that place. convention. I, I always exactly. say that to be an activist is uh, quite a unique thing because you don't have anybody that can tell you you can't. Right, right. Exactly. exactly. So yeah. I kind of like being on the activist side of things right, right. and just helping politicians. Yeah, I like a bit of both, um, especially with uh, my uh, uh, past as a youth advocate and mm -hmm. um, just working with bicycles and pedestrians and even as a public servant, as a community planner. Um, but I've been able to see that in some positions or in some uh, efforts, you need that political willpower, you need that backing as well too. So that's where I kind of switched over to the other side and looked to uh, bring change to the community. So I yeah, prefer to be on the other side yeah. and help, I like both. help those that <laughs> Right. Want that path? Exactly. Well, I love it. I love the coverage. Right. Okay? And right. I've done pretty well at helping candidates. Exactly. Okay. Getting elected right. myself, yeah. two times. Right. Guess what? Third time. Yeah. Third time is one of two things. Yeah. You're either third time's a charm, right. or you're a three time loser. So exactly. you got to pick that third yeah. race right. really, really, really carefully. Well. Right. But I really enjoy helping other people. Mm -hmm. I had right. Jimmy Carter come to Brock and mm -hmm. I wow. when I was in high school. He spoke right. to us, and that's what got me involved. That's nice. And I worked a thousand hours on his campaign. First President, exactly. I voted for. Yeah, oh, wow. me, me, nice, nice. I couldn't. I was 14. Right. I couldn't vote for him, <laughs> right. but I worked for him. And you I worked, thought he was wonderful. You worked yeah. a thousand He's hours, a guy, yeah. or you yes. gave him a thousand dollars, and you got a gold peanut that said Carter 76. Well, and I couldn't give it. him a thousand dollars. I do. I have it. You have it. It's you a, a it's a prized wow. possession. It's 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 nice. it's. It's, I have to get it. It's right. it, it, my father right. hid yeah. it so well oh, in the house wow. that I don't know where it is. Yeah. But right. we had six presidential candidates come to Brockton that wow. year. It was fascinating for mm -hmm. a fourteen-year-old right. to, to That's see what that. I, that. I miss I that part of politics of the they, um, the candidates used right. to Tone come to Brockton. John F. Kennedy. Yes. Right. They, well, we're going to get them back. We are. Yeah. I am right? trying. Yep, we are. I'm trying. We're going to get them back. I ask yep. them every time. Anybody, we'll we're welcoming mm -hmm. any candidate from the Democratic Party mm -hmm. to please come and join us at a meeting or at our events. It's, right. a, it's a great way hey. to meet 
a lot of people. We had United States Senator John Kerry on Face the Nation, Face the Nation yes. live for one of the breakfasts. So right. we can do that. If we get Elizabeth Warren to our breakfast, right. we we'll have Elizabeth. that kind of yes. coverage because they follow her around. Right. Yes. Okay, so we want her here and it's an election exactly. year Great and we program. want Mara here. We, and we want, want Mara, we want and Jay. We want everybody and, and we're gonna have we're gonna have fun. Right. I'm I'm, ex I'm, I'm pumped excited up after about the conference. this election Likewise. coming up. Yeah, it's gonna be so fun. I think it's, uh, it's gonna be good. Yeah. There's gonna yeah. be some canvassing coming up, right? Oh yes. So uh, I received a call today from Jay Gonzalez camp, and there's an opportunity on the 9th and 16th. They'll be in Brockton, mm -hmm. canvassing and passing out literature. Mm -hmm. So they're looking for some volunteers. So if anybody would like to get involved in the Jay Gonzalez campaign he's uh, looking for volunteers yes. now we have a Facebook page yes. for we the do. city committee we have a website it's yes Brockton right yes. and the Facebook is Brockton Democratic City Committee yes. Correct. Yes. so we'll put stuff up and let people know yeah. about it um, we do also we we have a PO box if anybody wants to send us a piece of letter I think it's 77566 I think I'll find it and we'll put it up. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll yes. put it up. I don't remember it. I don't, I don't remember know why. It sometimes I remember and sometimes <laughs> right, I don't. Right, right. Okay, any <laughs> phone numbers you guys want to give out? Uh, we don't have a, a party line, right. so to speak. We don't have a phone number for okay. the city committee. Do you want to give out personal numbers or, sure. or um, anything? So I can give my home number. It's 508 559 9670. Yep. And mine is 508-521-9725. Okay, we'll put that up on the screen and we'll get that out. And uh, the next time you guys come in here, you're going to be sitting in the host chair, yes. get some candidates to come down, and candidates that are opposed, even candidates that are unopposed. You want to bring right. Suzanne Bump over here? Right. She is on the ballot. There will right. be, I don't know if she has a Republican challenger or not. Sure. Mara Healy does. Yeah. She has a Republican challenger. And I'm not sure about um, Auditor, Treasurer, yeah. and Attorney Goldberg. General. Right. Okay, but obviously the, the, the governor candidates are opposed, the lieutenant governor candidates mm -hmm. are opposed, yes. and the Secretary, Secretary of State in the Democratic primary. Correct. So uh, wasn't that easy? That was very easy. You good? Yeah. yeah. You had fun? There you go. There you go. Yeah. Um, Jim, Jimmy's been on a TV a few times, times. So. and we're going to try to. I think we should get him to come down to the Cape Verdean Festival. Yeah. All oh, the yeah. candidates yes. to come down. That's Definitely. where. Yeah, that's where you see local candidates for right. office. We want to see state candidates for yep. office exactly. if they come down. They're going to fall in love with our Cape Verdean right. people that are so warm and yes. friendly in Brockton. And, and we have Summerfest exactly. in, in, in August. Right. Get them down. And then, Definitely. you know, like I said, there's a, the primary is September 4th. Fourth. Right. The Time's day different. after Labor Day. So right. here's the thing. Here's my advice. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you don't vote, don't complain. We want you to vote Democrat. We're all good Democrats. Right. And I got the rap cue, so I'm going to say <laughs> goodbye. Thanks for both being here. Thank, Thank you. For you. And uh, check out the Brockton Democratic City Committee. Thanks for watching. Sorry.